Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at the impact of the war on society and family life. We hear now from Dr Mary Cox about the challenges of keeping Britain fed. My name is Mary Cox. I'm a junior research fellow at Brazenose College, Oxford. I'm part of a project called Hunger Draws the Map, looking at hunger across Europe and the Ottoman Empire and the way that hunger affected the lives of civilians in particular. I'm interested in food supplies in the United Kingdom during the First World War. The United Kingdom was a great importer 60% of all foodstuffs, 80% of all grain at the outbreak of war came from abroad. The United Kingdom was not alone in importing foodstuffs. Germany imported 30% of all foodstuffs before the war broke out. The United Kingdom was able to maintain a relatively healthy population. We don't have diseases related to nutritional deprivation that are widespread. And that's important because in other parts of Europe, we do see problems. By October 1916, Roughly 2 million tons of merchant shipping had been lost through the German submarine campaign. But the government is hesitant early on in the war to begin food control. There's an idea that this could be done voluntarily. So there are suggestions in terms of what people should consume. Some of the suggestions are a little bit ridiculous. Eat your food slowly, soak it in water. The United Kingdom starts increasing imports from the United States and from Canada, even before the United States joins the war, to secure the food supply. Food control starts late in the war. You don't really get national rationing until 1918, till the spring. You have local rationing before then of some goods. Average caloric consumption in the UK at the outbreak of war was roughly 3,400 calories per person per day, roughly what people eat today. That's only an average. We know from recruits joining the army that there were many people who were not well nourished. In France, average caloric consumption at the outbreak of war was 3,800, and in Germany, average caloric consumption was 4,020. So what that means is that Germany could afford to lose some of those calories without making as much of a difference, whereas the United Kingdom could not. So 60% of the foodstuffs were imported. 40% were produced in the United Kingdom itself. The problems that faced farmers here also faced farmers in other countries. You have a loss of young men that were farming the land, of farm animals, there's a loss of fertilizer imports, a loss of fishermen and other skilled workers, the outbreak of war, many fishermen joined the army. There's something called the war book that provided instructions to different parts of government on what to do and how to act at the outbreak of war. Interestingly, there's nothing in there about food. But despite that, the government are obviously thinking about food. At the Declaration of London 1909, which set out the rules that would govern a naval activity if war were to break out. Foodstuffs were put onto the conditional contraband list, meaning that they could only be captured if they were going to an enemy government. There were three different categories of goods, absolute contraband, weapons, for example, conditional contraband, and those that were not contraband at all. The Order of Council on August 20th, 1914, moves foodstuffs from the conditional contraband list to the absolute contraband list. The government was criticized for this heavily, and it goes back down to the conditional contraband list. Eventually, they have a full blockade. Starting in November of 1914, the government have private companies that secretly buy foodstuffs for the government, and then the food is stored in secret. In 1915, rumors of this come out. Traders are frustrated. Because the government was buying food secretly, then this is increasing prices, they argue. The government denies it. Finally, they're discovered. So the government says that they've stopped. Actually, they continue to secretly buy up foodstuffs privately. Another thing that the government does is increase the amount of land that is being farmed. There are also discussions on what types of things should be farmed. The amount of grain from an acre of land will produce more calories than if the same amount of land was used to support pigs. And so there are plans that are followed to do things that will increase the total amount of calories. Prices are increasing throughout. And so you get complaints about the national food supply, public meetings, 
demands to keep prices down, but wages are also increasing. So even though prices of some goods are increasing, others relative to the wages people are making are not. To put this into perspective, Germany imported only 30% of their foodstuffs, and they ran into problems a lot sooner. A big part of this is because of the blockade that's preventing food from going in. Their food supply goes down, people cry for a food controller like they had in the UK, and national rationing starts in Germany in May 1916, so about two years earlier than it did in the United Kingdom. Some of the decisions that were made there that did not go well may have actually helped the United Kingdom because they were able to learn from their example. In Germany, they put a price cap on certain foodstuffs, the idea being that doing so would make food affordable to everyone. The problem is that it does nothing to increase food supply. If the baker can only sell bread at a certain price, then there's a motivation to sell things on a black market. I mentioned you can get more calories from grain per plot of land than you can from pigs. In Germany, they understood this. They wrote about this. They took it one step further in 1915. Nine million pigs are slaughtered. There's a glut of pork in Germany. It increases very quickly the protein intake of the population, and then it goes down. We don't have things like that. And actually, because of imports from the United States and from Canada, people start eating more bacon here in the latter half of the war. In a report that was done in 1918 called the Subner Report, they found that the nutritional status of very poor people actually increased during the war. I want to end by reading part of a letter that was written in January of 1916. This person was frustrated with increased prices of foodstuffs. He writes, The Board of Trade rarely publish particulars of food prices without issuing alongside of them the much heavier charges that have been inflicted upon the German and Austrian people. That is very clever, but not at all convincing, because after all, we are not subject to a naval blockade, as are the central powers. Indeed, the real fact is that it is because the German merchant service has been swept off the seas and the British Navy has been successful in its job that ship owners are able to charge extortionate freight, which add to the cost of most of our imported food, which governs in turn the prices of the home supply. Although this individual was frustrated because prices were increasing, his argument was that it's only because of the success of the British Navy that we have our food stuffs here and you're charging too much. But that's precisely the point. It was because of the success of the British Navy that the food supply was consistent during the war. In conclusion, the United Kingdom was able to maintain an adequate food supply, which meant that the civilian population was healthy and that some segments of the population actually increased their health during the war. Very poor people had a higher standard of living during the war in terms of what they were eating than they had before. When you remember that 60% of foodstuffs were from abroad, the British Navy did an incredible job of helping to maintain food supplies in the United Kingdom. And if they hadn't, it would have been catastrophic here. And we probably would have seen some of the problems that faced many other people on the continent. Diseases related to vitamin deficiencies, higher death rates from different diseases, starvation. That was Dr Mary Cox on the challenges of keeping Britain fed during the war. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Susan Grazel about women at war.